I'm going to bring in my partner, Carol Masser, joining me uh, as we do just about every day remotely uh, these days. Carol joining me from Jersey City. This is sort of our jam, Carol. What a great conversation. Oh, I love it. What... Oh, well, there you are. Hi. Here I am. I love what Mayor Durkin said that every day is like a dog year. We say this, right? Like we go through the week and we're just amazed at how much news has come out about the virus, just trying to keep up with it. And then the impact, whether it's on markets, whether it's on the business world, whether it's on individuals and kind of where we are in terms of the health crisis. So, so much to get our head around, but what a great conversation. And, um, you know, I thought it was also interesting how they said, you know, taking a vacation, a two week vacation, meaning Congress yeah. going away. I can't imagine FDR doing that, you know, during the Great Depression. Well, Just I mean, it is, it's, it's an interesting point too. And, and listen, you and I talk about this all the time. I made sort of a joke about it at, at the top. We do have a certain appreciation for mayors, obviously. And, Absolutely. you know, our bosses, uh, it certainly reminded us of that many times, but you and I have gotten a chance to to interview lots of mayors over the years, you know, internationally and nationally, uh, regionally and otherwise. And I remember uh, Mitch Landrew, then the mayor of New Orleans, saying, mm -hmm. you know, when you're a mayor, you're walking by your problems every morning. They are not at all removed. People know right. who you are, um, and they are uh, they are demanding action. I do love the, this program that our team has put together too, because we're really going from sort of the, the local to the state and national uh, level. Yeah. So I'm really excited to hear a conversation coming up. Well, and the thing is, we also talk about those folks that are on the front lines, whether it's mayors, whether it's governors, as you said, they're walking by um, their situation, their problems. They've become such an important voice, certainly in dealing with the virus. Speaking of important voices, I do want to bring in my guest. I'm delighted to have uh, with us, certainly uh, familiar to the Bloomberg audiences, and we're talking about the former uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. We're talking about Kathy Sebelius. She was also governor of Kansas. She was also the insurance uh, commissioner for that state. Um, Secretary Sebelius, thank you so much for participating in this. Um, you know, one of the things that I find interesting is that, good morning, is that we all talked about that this virus didn't discriminate, and yet we have ultimately found out it does discriminate big time. And I found it kind of staggering and upsetting that this was top news, you know, that this was impacting our most vulnerable societies and, and vulnerable populations. Um, why is it um, we kind of know some of the reasons why it has, but why haven't we been better about protecting these populations? Well, I think we see, unfortunately, the, the perfect storm of inequity uh, as this virus cuts across the country and the world. Um, people, unfortunately, lower income, uh, too many men and women of color don't have access to health insurance, and they don't then have a regular doctor, they don't have regular preventive care, they um, are in uh, a situation where they're often only dealing with the medical community at times of crisis. Uh, we have many more underlying pre-existing conditions in the minority population, higher rates of diabetes and heart disease, which again make for a vulnerable population uh, when you have then an illness falling on top of them. We have folks who live in denser populated area in denser households. Uh, the notion of social distancing and separating from others is, is great if you have a big yard to walk around in, if you have some place to get away from other people, if you're living in a public housing project, if you're living in a densely populated neighborhood and maybe multiple family generations in the same household, again, it's it's a very difficult situation. All of the social determinants on health, Carol, as you know, the, you know, as, as the doctors like to remind us, the air we breathe, the um, water you drink, the food you eat, where you eat and work and play, have much more to do with your health conditions than the individual interaction with a healthcare provider. So, those situations hit hardest on folks who are in an impoverished area, who don't have access to a work condition that, that is healthy, don't have places to play that are healthy. Um, and I would say finally, so many of um, our brothers and sisters in the minority populations are in 
service jobs and essential jobs that they haven't had the luxury of actually staying home and being able to work. So they're more exposed. They're home health aides. They are janitors in buildings cleaning up. They're picking up trash. They are doing jobs that are relied on by the communities to continue right. on, but they don't have the luxury of staying home. Well, you know, it's interesting because you talk about, you're right, you know, a lot of um, minorities, a lot of undocumented immigrants, they work in the hotel industry, they're working at restaurants, you know, and what's interesting is we knew that they didn't have much of a safety net going into the virus pandemic, but yet the pandemic has laid it bare for all of us. And I feel like one of the themes we've been tackling with here at Bloomberg is fear versus greed. I mean, one of the questions coming in from our viewers, how do you weight moral considerations against economic, you know, that we're not paying living wages to these individuals so that they can have a safety net, so that they can pay for health care. We're constantly, it feels like, you know, weighing that against making a profit. How do we weigh those two sides and get to a better, better place? Well, I think I think the notion always put forward too often from the business community is we can't afford X. We can't afford everyone to have health insurance. We can't afford paid leave for our workers. We can't afford a minimum wage for our workers. That's nonsense. What we can't afford is what we're going through right now, uh, which is going to cost trillions and trillions of dollars and maybe take an, an entire generation to recover from. The economic hit of today of trying to react to these huge gaps in our social service system, in our safety network, in our health system is what we can't afford. So I was listening to the mayors in the previous conversation um, I think the hopeful note is we've got to fill those gaps. We've got to come out of this, not just reacting to what the world used to look like, but planning uh, for a much different world going forward. But how do we do that? And I guess what I when I kicked off our conversation is that everybody was so shocked by the headlines about these gaps that are out there. They have been out there for decades at this point, right? And we've had, you know, lots of people talk about them. We've had administrations try to tr tackle them, but yet here we still are. And the most vulnerable are getting hurt once again. Well, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, what is happening though, is at least there's a bright light. Oftentimes there's a conversation about sort of us and those people and while it's uh, interesting and kind of a theory to talk about those people, um, too many folks don't interact, uh, don't think about it on a daily basis. This is really bringing those people up close and personal, and it's all of us. And one of the things about a disease that's the great equalizer, a virus, the great equalizer is if you're not healthy, and have the chance of making me not healthy, then I have a greater interest in it, right? If I'm an employer and suddenly have a workforce where if people don't have paid leave and they will not get tested because they can't afford to be off work, that could jeopardize my whole business. If suddenly I'm asked to, you know, if we reopen and go into a restaurant, I wanna know um, what the restaurant's policy is on sick leave for their, employees has everyone been tested has everyone been treated do they have a guaranteed job on the way back because that will give me assurance that it it is a safe place for me to be so we are suddenly really connected to one another in a way that um we hadn't been in the past and i think it gives a real urgency to you know you can send your kids back to school if you don't know that all the teachers there are healthy and ready to go, that the aides have been um, tested and are able to be treated, that the people who are serving lunch in the cafeteria are actually part of this big network. I mean, those situations suddenly are very important personally. It's interesting because we do that with, you know, hard goods, you know, ma manufactured clothes, right? We have our younger generation, myself, you know, looking at where is it made, you know, are they providing a living wage? Are they good to the environment? Something you did big time while you were um, secretary at the Obama administration is the Affordable Care Act. And we've got a poll and maybe we can bring it up for everybody's out there because almost 28 million people are still uninsured in the US. Um, and we may see that get worse because of the unemployment spike. So the question I have for everybody in the poll is how can the federal government 
ensure the uninsured receive adequate health care? And the options are to answer reopen enrollment on healthcare.gov with options available for those who lost employer coverage. Another answer, pay for the full cost of coronavirus related health expenses. Patients pay zero. Provide direct financial aid to those in the lowest income brackets and leave it up to state and local governments. So while people answer that poll, um, Secretary Sebelius, what's, what's your answer? How, how can the federal government ensure that the uninsured receive adequate care? Well, I think short term, um, we've got to do sort of all of the above opening up the marketplace so people who lose their employer-based insurance qualify for subsidies and can get insurance quickly. Put pressure on states. I live in a state, horrifyingly, where the legislature got themselves safely out of town and um, left the Medicaid expansion bill on the docket. There are enough votes there, but the president of the Senate has used a variety of procedural issues. We get 200,000 Kansans who are eligible for health benefits in the midst of a pandemic, and yet they're playing politics with people's lives. That's horrifying, and that's going on in 14 states around the country. I read recently, Carol, that community health centers, which are often the safety nets for people who don't have insurance, who may not be documented, who are not eligible for benefits, community health centers are looking at layoffs because of the restriction now in uh, primary care. That's terrifying. So pushing money quickly into those centers, making sure that they are available. Uh, but we have to do this long term. You know, testing right. for free was part of the bill. What about treatment? Who's going to get tested? I can't tell you before the Affordable Care Act, how many women would say to me, I know I can get a mammogram for free, but I won't go get a mammogram because I have no way to pay for the treatment if I have cancer. So all that will do is add worries right. to me. We've got the same situation with lots of folks. Why should they get treated? If they're positive, they're not gonna be able to get the, I mean, why should they get tested if they can't get treated? If they go into financial ruin because of ending up in a hospital, that can't happen in the future. So we gotta have a short term, get everybody healthy quickly, but also, we need an administration committed to universal health care. We need a Congress who says we're not going to try to take people's health care away. We're going to try to make sure that we have everybody in the United States with access to regular preventive health care. I have to ask you, how do you think the federal government has done so far in handling the virus? And I know you spoke uh, to the Associated Press, um, I guess, a few weeks ago or in the last month, and you said we basically wasted two months. I mean, timing, we know, has been so important in dealing with this virus and getting ahead of it. Well, I think, unfortunately, we still are in a situation in mid-April having the same conversation we were having at the beginning of February. We need massive infusions of tests everywhere. I don't want people just to be tested on the way into the hospital, that's important. But what's really important is to know who's asymptomatic and roaming around. Uh, we need massive community testing. And you know, you heard Mayor Durkin in, in Seattle, yes, we had outbreaks in the nursing homes and yes, they were on top of that. What about the testing throughout the Seattle community? How many people actually have the virus who never show symptoms? What does that look like? What are the patterns? So way behind on testing still. We are getting now all kinds of mixed messages. Uh, you know, For a long time, we were told, don't worry about this. We got it under control. Then we were told it's very serious. Now we're, we're in a situation, um, I was saying to somebody the other day, I have the feeling I'm in the car again with my children when they were very small, saying, are we there yet, mommy? Are we there? No, we just left the driveway. Are we there yet now? Are we almost there? No, we're not there yet. We need a message about how we get from where we are now, mid-April of 2020, to a major vaccination campaign throughout the country. That's a long stretch. That's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not going to be over next week or next month. It's going to be multiple phases. We need somebody who's communicating that. Uh, well, out of the White House, uh, we need the scientists to tell us what the plan is. I wanted to ask you as a former governor and then also as a former member of an administration, as you see the battle between the federal government and the governors, I'm just curious, you know, kind of where do your sympathy lies and what do you make of the governors banding together, which, which people have thought, I will say, I feel like there's a consensus that that's been our leadership model 
and thank God for that. Well, I've never seen anything like this in my life. The entire time I was the governor, uh, George W. Bush was the president. So I'm a Democrat and he's a Republican. That didn't matter in times of crisis. We had a number of natural disasters. We had a number of, you know, we had a huge economic downturn. Um, we were all in this together. We had a, you know, we might have had debates between the governors and the federal government always on how far you go, how many rules there are, is there enough money? But there was never a sense that we were being pitted against one another, or that red state governors were treated differently than blue state governors, or that you were criticized for asking for resources, help and support that was uniquely at the federal level. I've never seen a situation like this in my life. It has to be terrifying to be a governor, to know that if you ask for what you need in your state for your citizens, that you're somehow regarded as unappreciative, that you're being told your calls might not be returned. That's a terrible message. And governors are wise to band together and say, we're going to you know, be this sort of grown up in the room. We're going to lay out rules and the rules have to be regional. They can't be border right. at a time. And, and we're gonna try to make our plan for how we deal with the next year. So how do you see the next year? And it's interesting, there's um, a question that's come in, how can the pharma industry contribute to better access to healthcare in a crisis? And we, it's interesting to see, I feel like, whether it's Silicon Valley or the pharmaceutical you know, communities, often competitors now working together, right, for a common good. You are very familiar with a lot of the pharmaceutical companies. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, a couple of things. One is there's a great scramble underway, a scramble in a good way that uh, people are feverishly working on what could be very positive treatments for this disease. So we really can lower the death rate. Even if we have spikes again, we can figure out treatments that really work. That's a huge, important role of the pharma industry and concentrating on that and moving ahead on that is, is hugely important. I think the vaccine, again, uh, there are tests and trials and things underway. Um, we may get lucky in that the first one or two uh, have a real hit. We may, it may take longer. I think it's really important for pharma to, again, speak with a voice and remind people that we are, uh, we have treatments now for diseases that were continue, that were considered to be a death sentence. We have vaccines uh, for diseases, which people thought could never be eradicated, that this is really the promise and possibility of science and that we're collaborating. And I found it terrifying to have the right. president of the United States suggest that he would withdraw funding from the World Health Organization. This is a global crisis. We are uh, fortunate to be one of the richest countries on the face of the earth, but my God, this is going to hit in developing countries and a disease in a developing country will have a much wider swath, but it also, makes Americans left safe and secure. As long as this virus is circulating, it can come right back home. So participating in a global solution, participating in a global effort to uh, share information, right. eventually share treatments and vaccines is hugely important. This is the worst time in the world to withdraw from the global community. Just got about 30 seconds left here. Do you think we've done what we need to do for a reopening of society? No, um, no, we absolutely have to test. We have to have a way of surveilling people as they come back and an effective um, tracking system. And right. I think we need to make progress toward treatment so that we know if it spikes again, that we actually can treat some of the more seriously ill and not look at, again, a spiraling death rate. Secretary Sebelius, thank you so much. We really appreciate your insight. Um, have a great day and, and thanks again. We really appreciate it. Thanks.